very much. Can I apologise for the slight delay and welcome everyone to the third and you'll be delighted to know colleagues the final meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing in 2016. Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as interview with broadcasting even when they switch to silent. With no apologies, but I do welcome Roderick Campbell and Graham Pearson who have been intermittently regular visitors to... The, can you be intermittent and regular? I don't know, but anyway, you've been visitors prior to this to the committee. Move on to item one. It's the main item of business today. It's the evidence session on the issues considered by the subcommittee since its creation three years ago. And I welcome the meeting of Chief Constable of Police Scotland, uh, Philip Gormley, and Andrew Flanagan, Chair of the Scottish <coughs> Police Authority, who are both appearing before the subcommittee for the first time. But members here of the Justice Committee have uh, seen you previously. I also welcome the Deputy Chief Constable, Rose Fitzpatrick, been here before, haven't you? And John Foley, the SPA's Chief Exec, also a visitor before, are here in a supporting capacity. And I go straight to questions from members. John Finney. Uh, good afternoon, panel. Uh, Chief Constable, a question for yourself, and it's about the... W w we've been out and about, and we went to Elgin, uh, Mr Stewart and I, and we returned. And one of the issues that came up was uh, what discretion officers would be afforded. And we heard varying opinions. We heard that the discretion had been removed from officers, but we also heard from senior officers that with regard to a specific example of speeding, a number of people were warned about their conduct and a number were charged. Can you advise what your position is in the, in the where, where discretion plays a part in operational policing, please? Certainly, thank you. Um, I, I think it's absolutely four square at what good, in, in the centre of what good policing looks like. And um, the conversations I've been having with staff, um, and I've just come from a meeting of chief inspectors um, not far away, is actually we, we need to make sure that we understand productivity and what good policing looks like, and it will vary from community to community, and that we enable officers to make the right sorts of decisions um, for those communities that they understand that's relevant. So um, discretion, the ability to apply professional judgment in terms of what they think will work in those circumstances is absolutely at the heart of good policing. And, and I think there's, um, for me, there's a, there's a sort of continuum in operational, in organisational life. And at one end, you've got malicious compliance, and the other, you've got discretionary effort. And malicious compliance for me is, uh, I did it, although it was obvious that I shouldn't do it because you told me to, or I didn't do it, although I should have done because you hadn't told me to. And at the other end is, it isn't written down, but I know what the values of the organisation are. I know what this member of the public needs at this point, and I'm going to act in accordance with those values and my professional judgment to deliver the right sort of service. And I, I want an organisation that routinely operates towards the discretionary effort end. Now, there are areas where there are non-negotiables. So you don't want to be reinventing a new approach to a firearms incident in the middle of a threats to life incident. So I'm not naive around it. But most of, most of the routine sort of waft and weave of policing is about ambiguity and calls for ser uh, service where, you know, there are a range of judgments that can be made. And I want officers to be confident they can make the best judgments uh, according to the circumstances that they see. And, and your example um, around speeding, I think, is a really good one. Because for me... What is the outcome we want? The outcome is less road deaths, less serious injuries, less danger on our roads. And actually, the evidence of the last 12 months is that we're probably moving in the right direction around that. And, and part of that will be the issuing of speeding and other fixed penalty notices and enforcement measures. Some of it will be about proper, sensible advice to people who've perhaps had a momentary lapse of concentration. And, you know, officers will be best placed to make those sorts of decisions about whether this is a, an issue where actually, in terms of public safety, we need to separate that individual from their driving licence, or whether this is actually an area where some advice, some sensible intervention will have a greater um, protective effect. And, and, you know, we have seen uh, a greater degree of advice given as opposed to simple enforcement tickets being issued. And at the same time, we've seen an encouraging reduction in death and serious injury on the road. So sort of a long answer, but I do think discretion, it, it, you need to be careful about and clear about the sets of circumstances where actually this is non-negotiable. But for the vast majority of the sorts of incidents policing is dealing with across Scotland day in, day out, officers need to be confident about making the right decisions. Might have been a, a long answer, but it was a, a very reassuring answer, and I'm Thanks. sure we are sure not only politicians, but officers and the public as well. Can I ask about one area where there has been conflict, please, and that is on that point because it was raised with a constituent that in England the, I don't know if it's a police matter or whether it's a government matter they can go and drive our improvement courses rather than just have a warning or a ticket yes. and I understand there aren't any in Scotland is that 
within your remit? And if it is, what's your view? Um, I, I'm going to have to admit I don't know whether it's in my remit, but I certainly have a view that I, I think the solution to road deaths is a, is a combination of engineering, enforcement and education. And, and, and the system that prevails in, in England and Wales is if you um, exceed a speed limit up to a certain level, so I think it's 10% plus two miles an hour, broadly speaking, you, you are offered as an alternative to a fixed penalty ticket, a driver, uh, a speed awareness course. Um, yeah. And actually, um, there's some very powerful evidence coming back from those in terms of people who attend them, who find them really helpful. Um, we do need some longitudinal research around the, the genuine impact on reoffending and, and road safety, but instinctively, it feels like the right thing to do because instinctively, I think somebody who goes and spends five or six hours um, carefully and sensibly going through a programme that, that helps them understand and perhaps re reequates them with their safe driving techniques, as opposed to potentially a fixed penalty ticket arriving through the post three weeks later and you're scratching your head trying to remember where it was that you were. Human nature suggests that the former is going to be more effective. So it does exist in England and Wales. Um, I think there's some real merits in those sorts of approaches. Thank you. Sorry, it just popped into my yeah, head no, there, John. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, Chief Council, I was going to ask about stop and search. I know it predates you the, the particular issues, but it, it's still very much a live issue. Um, do you have a view, having come from a background where everything was on a statutory footing, of the benefits of that against so-called consensual searches, which a number of people, myself included, are very uncomfortable about? Um, I guess you're a product of where you've been and how you've been socialised. I mean, I have only operated in an environment where... Um, we have statutory stop, stop and search. Um, I, I think it provides sensible protections. I think it provides officers with clarity. Um, I think it provides accountability. Um, and I think stop and search is a really important tactic, but it needs to be intelligence-led, uh, and it needs to enjoy the support of the communities that it seeks to protect. So, um, you know, my, my policing experience is that statutory stop and search is, is provides the best um, protection for the public in terms of legitimacy, um, and also clarity for officers. Much and in relation to Mr John Scott Cousy, who did the report in, in relation to that, we heard from him here, he used a, a phrase people might have been surprised at, and that was that the police service should be the frontline defenders of the citizens' human rights. Do, do you have a view on that? I completely agree with that. I, I mean, I think policing needs to be on the side of the overwhelming majority of law-abiding citizens of whichever country we're, we're operating in. And actually, it needs to respect the rights of those that are, that are um, for whatever reason, offending. Um, you know, absolutely at the heart of good um, policing in any liberal democracy is a proper understanding of human rights and the responsibilities that come with it. And we, and we need to protect the vulnerable. Thank you again, very good issue. Let's take somebody else now. Because I I've got a very, very small one, if I may. No, I want to take everybody else now. Come back, right. I okay, promise. Thank you very much. Margaret, thank you. then Alison, then Elaine, then Kevin. Margaret. I could ask the Chief Constable if he's satisfied that um, effective lines of communication have been established between stakeholders and local commanders in order to um, make sure that lines of communication are there and that um, local priorities are, are being looked at. I think there's always work to be done. Um, I think we're now in a position where we've got good local relationships. We have local, 32 local policing plans. Um, my, my anecdotal um, evidence as I've gone around the country is we need to do more in terms of explaining the connection between national capability and national decision making and how it impacts locally. Uh, I think there's more work to be done there. I'm not surprised that that's where we are, but I mean, enormous achievements have been delivered, in my view, in the last three years. Um, but connecting that local service and, and reconnecting into some of the points Mr Finney was making around discretion and enabling people to make local decisions relevant to the areas they're policing is really important. Um, we've got some work going on this year in terms of public consultation. So we're la launching Your View in April, which will be a digital-based ongoing consultation process, not just a once-off. It will enable people um, with sensory uh, impairments um, as, as well as you know, the rest of the population to contribute in terms of how our understanding of what good policing looks like and what they want from good policing in their areas. So, so what I'm not trying to do is paint a, uh, you know, a, a everything's rosy picture. I think, I think we're in a good place. I think there's more that needs to be done over the next year or so. 
very often there's a turnover of commanders and, and even today speaking to some farmers they were saying quad bikes have been stolen in our area again and the local police that were there have moved on they were there for a number of years they seem to be on top of it is there a balance to be struck there there's always a balance to be struck i agree i mean i i, I in my 30 years that's always been an issue in policing in terms of the desire for uh, consistency in local communities in terms of the, the officers there we are in a um, a bit of a demographic bubble at the moment there was a lot of officers joined in the early 80s mid 80s because of the Evan Davis pay award um, at that time those officers are now coming to the 30-year point so we're seeing uh, a, a larger number than usual of officers leaving particularly at the more senior ranks so we've gone through a process internally of looking at what does that mean in terms of divisional commanders, superintendents and assistant chief constables uh, and, and there is a reality there will be a turnover in the next 12 to 24 months. My ambition will be to mitigate that. We are looking really carefully at um, succession planning. Um, going to your earlier point, we've had to make some new appointments at, at divisional commander level. Um, Rose has written out to um, the leaders of the local authorities asking for the sorts of skill sets, the sorts of challenges, the sort of person they want what I don't think I can get to the position is of allowing them to choose, but understanding what are the local issues there and, and, and enabling us to fit as best we can the sort of individuals that we've got available against the, the skills. There is also clearly the ongoing necessity to um, talent manage, career develop, and make sure that we're growing the next set of leaders, both for general positions and local positions within a national organisation. But, but I share the ambition and on occasion the frustration that, that we need to keep people in positions. Um, and what I would say is, you know, predominantly the officers who are policing communities across Scotland un, in, under the Police Scotland badge were the officers who were policing it under the legacy cap badges. But, but I do uh, recognise the issue, and it's one that I'm alive to, and we try within the constraints of a national organisation with the sorts of turnover that we have at the moment to, to minimise the impact. I think the local authorities will very much appreciate being consulted on that because they have very good local intelligence which can feed back and help and it's been uncertain the extent to to how, how, how much they felt depending on each authority they have been involved in that and fine. Alice. Perhaps just following on from that, I mean communities and councils have identified the erosion of local police and local decision making as, as a real concern. And I suppose what I'm interested to know is um, your views on the autonomy of divisional commanders, um, how far you consider it possible to legitimise different policing approaches um, in different communities around Scotland? Um, again, I'm, I'm, you're going to find me in violent agreement with the ambition behind your statement. I think what we've got to be careful is that in that we don't build in a lot of bureaucracy and cost. So I've, I've operated in other policing environments where I had a fully devolved budget. That meant I spent an awful lot of my time managing it and I then needed the infrastructure of a local business manager. And a, you know, that there are, we've got to be careful that how we operationalise that ambition. Um, we are talking at the moment, uh, Rose and I and other senior colleagues, around what good performance will look like going forward and how we represent those locally driven ambitions for policing into a framework that has the right balance between headline national figures that you know, a good competent police force should be in control of and local issues and give and give due regard to those uh, the, the meeting i came from this morning which was all of the chief inspectors in the eastern region 30 and you know this was a live conversation we were having this morning about how do we empower you in a realistic way because again you know we've got limited funding and we need to make sure that we don't have a sort of a you know a thousand flowers bloom kind of experience when we haven't got enough fertilizer for that number of plants a vulgar expression excuse me but but um yeah did you well, you lost me last week, but, uh, so. <laughs> um, but, but the, you know, the discret sorry, the, the, the serious point ar around um, local discretion, local decision making. You know, commanders want it because they want to. They want to make a difference, and, and I don't want to frustrate that. Um, and, you know, I don't know whether Rose, you, you want to come in around how we've moved that. My, my, again, early on in any transition, there's a necessity to grip things really tightly at the centre because actually there's a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of different systems, a lot of different cultures, a lot of different practices. I think three years in is the point at which we can understand which bits of that grip we can now release, because we don't want to grip so hard that we strangle innovation. But nor do I want to end up in a position where uh, we've got a sort of a chaotic approach where we're not clear about what we're clear about, where staff are not 
um, sure about what we want as an ambition. Um, so so there's a, there is always a balance, but I think th the, the ambition is one that I share. And do you understand that um, I think Police Scotland's view of what local policing is um, differs significantly from what communities and local councils think of as policing? Um, and that the plethora of national teams that have been set up sort of mitigates against delivering that kind of holistic local policing uh, that communities are looking for? Well, um, <clears throat> I, I'm not sure. This is probably the first time that I necessarily accept the, the whole of the proposition there. I think what we have seen... Uh, across the country is some uh, real advances in terms of what communities can now access. So uh, again, I mentioned, I think the week before last, the, the absolute revolution in the approach to domestic violence uh, is, is really significant. Um, the ability to land really high quality major investigation teams into any part of the country, which wasn't possible with the competence we have now. The, the ability to deploy air support to search for missing people in a way that was not as easily achieved. So, so there are um, real advantages around the national. Um, and I, I go back to my earlier point. I think the challenge going forward is, is how we explain that, how we make sure that it is available, uh, and how we retain the essence of local policing. Um, you know, I, I think we need to go through, we will need to go through a reassessment of demand and risk. You know, both demand that we know about, latent demand and emergent demand because crime is changing. Understand what that means in terms of risk and vulnerability and then make the inevitable hard decisions about where resource goes against that, those emerging and changing threats. If I might turn to Mr Flanagan, um, one of the ongoing criticisms of the SBA has been around its inability to proactively identify um, issues that it needs to scrutinise and it's constantly played catch up and, and this committee has had to um, step into the breach on a number of occasions. What, what is the SPA doing now in order to, to, to identify issues ahead of, the, ahead, of, ahead of things? Well, one of the things that we're, is one of the issues that I'm <laughs> tackling within the governance review and how we um, work with Police Scotland more closely to identify issues as they're coming down the track and what processes go on in terms of the debate between Police Scotland and the SPA in terms of what we think is the uh, correct approach for that. There is a, a, a <clears throat> I think the role of the SPA has to be in terms of how do we represent the public view? Because actually, uh, policing only can succeed where it has consent from the public to police. Uh, now, at the same time, that principle uh, sits at a little bit of tension with the operational independence of the police in order that they can carry out their duties as they see fit. And the two things need to work in balance with each other. So one of the issues I'm addressing within the governance review is how do we actually do uh, identify those issues if we've touched on some of them at the moment, stop and search, whatever, where clearly there was public concern uh, and therefore the consent to police was at question and the SPA should have been at the forefront in discussing that uh, with, with uh, Police Scotland. So I, I have to accept the criticism that, that, that was there, that, that we weren't being proactive, but one of the things that I think going forward we have to ensure is that the dialogue between ourselves and Police Scotland are looking at these issues in advance and it's not just about um, uh, the performance of policing but it's actually also about the way we police and that, uh, that has to be uh, a, a close involvement between uh, uh, both the Chief Constable and myself but also the wider SPA and Police Scotland and, and I think you will see hopefully in that some recommendations in the governance review about how we might do that. I might finally ask before you ask other people um, what progress there has been on the development of the code of practice on stop and search. That's clearly pivotal to moving forward. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, well, uh, we, uh, as you know, um, have been doing a lot of work ourselves to get ourselves ready for the implementation of a code of practice. My understanding is that Scottish Government will be doing a public consultation in relation to the code and also issues around um, alcohol and uh, young people. Uh, and of course we will contribute to that and support um, any information or, or data that we have, um, that, that debate and consultation. Um, Sorry, a consultation, we've only got a few more, a week and a half to go, so we'll get, what's the 
deadline for that? I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't, we'll have, to ask I the don't know the dates. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to no, stop you there, but it's just that, yeah. as we know, we're, yeah. Yeah. we rise in March the after March the 23rd. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, the legislation is such that this has to happen. So yeah. Yeah. government takes it on, we'll have to. Whichever government. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Do you finish, Mark? Yes, Alison, moment. sorry about that. Fine. Elaine, then Kevin. And I've got time. Perhaps, yeah, yeah. They want to ask if they don't get off their mark. So we've got John <laughs> there still. Your point's been covered. Perhaps. Your point's been covered. We'll definitely have time, perhaps. <laughs> right. <laughs> Elaine. Okay. Yeah, can I return, actually, to the issues around local um, policing and you know, the relationship between local areas and the, and the, and the centre? And I wonder, Chief Constable, have you... How sort of contact have you had with local divisions? Have you been to visit the local divisions? Have you discussed with officers at all levels their perceptions? Because one of the things that we found on our visits uh, was, certainly in Dumfries, is that the perception of the, the constables, for example, in terms of the, you know, how they were being directed and so on, was rather different to the more senior members of staff. And I just wondered what sort of contact, how you're managing to bring in that, that sort of I, I'm endeav endeavouring to go on a Scottish world tour, really. I am... I, um, <laughs> Seriously, I, I mean, my, I, I have said it overtly that my first three months will be more about receive than transmit. Um, and so far, without, I, I will get some of this wrong, but I've been to Inverness, Dingwall, Stornoway, Inveruri, Aberdeen, uh, and into the Kingdom of Fife, also into Edinburgh uh, and Glasgow. And, and, and what I've been doing is um, having a conversation with officers, actually. I've been explaining to them my view about what the four broad main challenges are for us going forward in t over the next 12 to 24 months. And, and more importantly, listening to them in terms of how they feel about the organisation. Um, my, my, you know, I, I, what they are saying to me is actually they've noticed in the last 12 months that there's been a change of tone around performance. So the sort of example that Mr uh, Finney was alluding to earlier where they don't feel as driven uh, if they were ever being driven to um, hit targets around um, speeding tickets. Um, there is a greater level of discretion they are describing coming back into their sort of daily work. Um, I, I, I've been out and spoken to local authorities, so each of these visits is really... It's, I've, I've normally had two or three staff engagements in the day and then spent an hour or two with the local civic leaders, um, the chief executive, just to get a sense from their point of view what it feels like to be a stakeholder and a partner of Police Scotland. A and coming back from that is re real, genuine um, uh, support and commitment to the local service that's been delivered. And I have seen extraordinarily strong relationships between divisional commanders and local civic leaders. There is, what I have said earlier, an amb a desire to better understand how the national plays into the local and how... Um, we can more effectively hear voices at the centre from uh, localities. I was having conversations with Rose about some simple measures we can probably put in place in terms of using our area ACCs to more effectively engage, both in terms of um, briefing on issues at a national level, but more importantly, hearing how things are landing locally so that we, we get a better, more nuanced um, relationship with local authorities. So um, my, my sense, again, I don't want to overstate this, is I think staff are hugely enthusiastic. They're doing really great work. It is being recognised and valued by the communities they serve. There is an amb ambition from the staff to have more discretion, to build on that, and there's an, ambi an ambition locally from civic leaders, and you will know this better than I, to, better, to be better connected to some of the big decisions that Police Scotland has to make in the national interest. Yeah, I mean, also in terms of it's not just that, the... the, the the feeling, I think, in, in, lo in local authorities and local communities now that they don't have the same relationship with the police as they used to, basically. I mean, they're, they're not getting the same sort of uh, opportunities to feed in their views or to comment and so on as they had when, they, certainly in, in my area, which was in Fries and Galloway, and I would say do, do come south as well, actually, because a lot of the places you've been are, are further north. Do come south. What, where, whatever my itinerary looks like, it will offend somebody. I deliberately didn't start in the central belt. Yeah, but, I, 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 but any moment pitch so in terms of the way in which I mean, this is also a question really for Mr Flanagan as well in the SPA and actually how you can improve uh, the accountability and the relationship not just obviously with, with staff but also with the public and with local communities that they feel that they are being consulted or they've got the opportunity to express their views uh, on uh, either operational matters or, or on pol uh, policy matters. 
not hog the microphone at all, but, but again, I suppose I would put point to what I said to earlier in terms of our, your view being launched, the public consultation. We're doing a lot of work to get a better uh, level of connectivity with local communities so we can hear their voices. Um, you know, the, the governance review that clearly is the SPAs, I, I'm, I'm on the independent reference group for that, and that's clearly a live issue for the SPA and for the service, and I, I, I'll let the, ch the chairman reflect his views on that, obviously. Um, Reviews that's still on track for the end of March. It is, uh, in, uh, in fact, uh, I suspect it should be delivered next week. All right, thank you. Um, as part of the governance review, we, we did quite an extensive uh, consultation uh, with uh, through local authorities and, and, and wider, uh, and uh, there were common themes that came back through the, through that consultation, um, and. Not so much that it was they were happy with the involvement of the SPA in, in terms of local engagement, but it was on those points that you're making about how on the ground engagement actually works with uh, Police Scotland. Um, and I think one of the things, or a couple of the things that were coming through, one was how are national decisions, especially when they're made by some of those specialised services that were referred to earlier, how perhaps the communication of how that decision has been made does not feed down through the organization as well as it might in terms of local commanders because they they form part of local policing rather than national services and therefore understanding how a decision has been made and why that may not be uh, in line with what the, the local community uh, thinks that is not effective enough and I think that's a, that's a point that we need to uh, address uh, and equally it's not clear how their initial engagement and how their views are fed through into the, the top of the organisation. And I think we need to work with Police Scotland to make sure that the, the, the communication loop is working more effectively, that both it's going up and down in terms of the organisation. Because I, th I think one of the things that came out from some of the consultation was that there was an acceptance that not always could the the desires of the local community would be met. Uh, there was an acceptance of, the, of, of that. But when a decision uh, was going in, in an opposite direction, they wanted to know why. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable uh, position to take. And I don't think the people who are communicating are always fully understanding the background to how the decision was made. And I think that's where we can improve. Just, and just finally, uh, Mr. Flanagan, I think you were quite critical, weren't you, of the skill set of the the board of the SPA and you felt that there were insufficient people with a sort of accounting economist type of background, you, you, you thought there needed to be some changes. I just wondered whether you were content there are sufficient members with policing uh, backgrounds, either serving officers or people who have been involved in, in uh, local authorities, uh, policing operations and so on. Just to be precise, I, I wasn't particularly critical of. Mm. of but you felt the, you, I, think you I, said I felt you there felt were gaps in, in the yeah, uh, in, the skill set. in in the skill sets, um, and it's uh, we have two ex uh, police officers that uh, uh, sit on the the board, uh, so we have some access to those skills. But one who was a former chief constable only joined us last uh, summer, I think. Uh, and, and, and uh, I think we need to strengthen that area. There are other gaps, as uh, someone mentioned earlier, uh, uh, human rights. And I think that's somewhere that uh, we should actually ha have that, those sort of skills around the table as well. So what we're doing at the moment is creating a skills matrix, if you like, in terms of what skills we think board members have, and also then trying to match uh, the um, the skills that we already have and identify what gaps we need to fill. Finance was a, a more obvious one and more pressing uh, because we, 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 we have got financial challenges uh, and therefore that's why uh, to fill some of the vacancies that we currently have, uh, I identified finance as a particular requirement. Thanks. Kevin. Um, thank you, Convener. Can I start off with the, the local policing aspect? and? Mr Finney mentioned earlier that him and I paid a visit to Elgin uh, and during the course of that visit talking to members of the community council there uh, they felt fully informed uh, about what was going on in their area 
uh, and also felt that they had a major part to play in the formulation of the local policing plan. And in some regards, it was very difficult to get them to say a, a bad word uh, about the force, even though we tried. Uh, <laughs> uh, has, uh, coming from the North East, you know, um, Chief Superintendent Adrian Watson, who's just retired, has been fantastic, as far as I'm concerned, um, in listening to communities and bringing communities with him. And yet, other colleagues visiting other parts of the country uh, found that folk didn't feel that they were involved in the formulation and the priorities of the local policing plan. How, uh, Mr Gormley, can we ensure um, that the exporting of good practice um, and that inclusivity is, uh, is right across the country rather than in just um, certain areas? How do we make sure that the south of Scotland uh, folks feel the same way as the northeast of Scotland folks uh, in terms uh, of local policing plans and their involvement? Um, uh, uh, the, the, I think critical to that role is, is the assistant chief constables who sit at area level. So uh, we have, I'm sure you're aware, I don't want to patronise anyone, but we have a, an ACC for the north, the east and the west. So, so identifying good practice, whether it's in relation to consultation and the creation of plans and local approaches to performance or some of the really good innovative work we've seen going on around mental health uh, and pilots that we've got that are um, producing real dividends around reducing demand and providing a better service to our most vulnerable that, that in a national organization is a is, is a challenge um, i think as we um, settle and embed uh, the service over the next year 12 24 months we, we need to work harder to identify what has gone really well. What do we need to replicate? What, what works well in one environment but simply won't in the other? Because again, if you look at some of the historic criticism or, or, or present criticism, it, it is a, a one size fits all. And I know that's particularly sort of directed at what some people have called the Strathclydation of Scotland. Um, so, so, you know, that, that is, I think, a real challenge for us, and it's an enormous opportunity because there is some really good innovative work. And we need to coach. Uh, you know, w there are some really good chief superintendents. I alluded earlier that we're going through a period of transition. We've got some new ones. There's a role for all of us on the executive to, to support people who are new into role and make sure that they're learning from the best. Um, and, and actually, how do we expose them to the, the best practice and the experience of their colleagues? So I think there's a range of issues, but, but essentially it's about good leadership. It's about bringing people together. It's about listening. It's about creating a collaborative culture rather than one that is a not invented here, therefore I don't do it. It's the one that, that borrows with pride, plagiarises with confidence. Um, it, it's that sort of continuous improvement that we need to make sure which is always going to be a challenge in a national organisation, as big and disparate as we are, that we actually grab those, those gems and promulgate them. One of the things which we see in other areas of business is the fact that folk tend to keep their good ideas to themselves. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you, you talked of borrowing and plagiarism there because there's uh, no ill in uh, doing both of those things to improve public services right across the country. Um, you mentioned mental health. Um, there and uh, obviously there has been some uh, at intensive training in that regard. Um, does that also cover autism, which uh, I know that there is a, a misunderstanding sometimes of uh, folk with autism who often end up in trouble um, much more than they should because of that misunderstanding? Yes, I'm just right. Yes, I, I, I can help with that. Um, our Central Safer Communities uh, team is working with a number of organisations that support people with learning and other disabilities, um, and those with sensory impairments and so on, to uh, help improve and provide better training for our officers and our staff who have direct contact with members of the public to assist with those kind of situations where there may be communication difficulties or behaviours which are um, entirely in keeping with perhaps conditions that people have or disabilities that they have but w which may not be something that officers come across regularly so we're continually looking to improve the training that we provide to officers. Right. Uh, I want to move on um, to scrutiny of large projects, um, which uh, this uh, subcommittee has done to a degree. Um, and if I could maybe turn to Mr Flanagan first, um, please, uh, because obviously we have heard of um, some of the problems that there is around about uh, the implementation of I-6. 
Um, uh, there's also, uh, of course, been uh, a look at C3IR. Can I ask how um, the SPA uh, has been scrutinising major projects? And do you establish um, subgroups um, to scrutinise these major projects to any degree? Uh, we have a, a subgroup of board members uh, uh, who it's a, called uh, Business Transformation that does have some uh, uh, work in terms of looking at the larger projects. Uh, sp specifically on I6, uh, John Foley uh, sits on the programme board uh, along with representatives from Scottish Government and from Police Scotland in terms of looking at uh, I6. Um, we rely heavily on Police Scotland in terms of reporting to us in terms of these uh, projects uh, because we don't have a huge capacity ourselves in terms of that. And in fact, going back to one of the um, <coughs> skill gaps that's been identified, someone with uh, experience of major projects and uh, major change programmes is uh, something that I would identify as being a weakness that we have. You're basically saying to me that you don't have the experience to scrutinise major projects to the degree that you probably should. I think that's fair. Uh, and how are you counteracting that? You said that you're looking well, at bringing in folk who have... Yes, it's, uh, so we, I think that one of the skills that we should have at uh, board level is um, someone with big project management uh, and change management uh, skill sets. And uh, that's what I intend to do through the recruitment programme. And how quickly is that going to be in place, Mr. Flanagan? Uh, we we have uh, ready to go. We should be starting to advertise for new members uh, before uh, we go into Purda, uh, and that advertising process would run through uh, up to the uh, election, and then uh, we'd be in a position to make recommendations to ministers uh, af once after the election, once uh, new uh, ministers appointed. So, in terms of the information that you have been receiving from Police Scotland round about those major projects, you've said that you, you probably sc can scrutinise these things to the degree that you should because you don't have the personnel. But do you feel that the information that you've had from Police Scotland on these major projects um, has been open and transparent? I, I, I think it's reasonable. Could we have had more information? Yes, we could have had. Uh, I think, to some extent, Police Scotland themselves, if I go back to I6, have been dependent on the supplier in terms of uh, uh, providing information. And there are some situations where it was very late in the day. We've, I felt that uh, we were beginning to see testing problems on I6. Uh, now, uh, that was as late as um, October, November uh, last year, when the first uh, rollout was supposed to take place in December. So I think that <coughs> indicates that uh, Police Scotland themselves were somewhat surprised by uh, some of the difficulties that uh, came through. Uh, Mr Gormley, uh, do you feel that the scrutiny of uh, major projects by uh, the SPA of Police Scotland has been robust enough? And I know that's a strange question to ask yourself, but um, there's no harm in some good uh, scrutiny taking place. Do you think that scrutiny of these major pro projects by the SPA has been robust enough? Um, I'm not sure I can answer that with any degree of precision historically. What, what I would say is going forward, in terms of public confidence, we do need um, proper scrutiny because actually, you know, I'm used to operating in an environment where I'm held to account and actually the level of reassurance that can be provided by good scrutiny underpins public confidence. And actually, you know, if we are not delivering in the way that we need to, then I want to know as early as possible. So. Um, you know, others will have to comment on whether they think the level of scrutiny was appropriate historically, but I think going forward, uh, in the way that the Chairman <coughs> describes, we, we do need um, robust and transparent scrutiny processes around major projects and programmes. And do you feel that the information that the force has supplied to I6, um, has, in, in terms uh, of this one, has been open and transparent? Have you I, given I've not, them...? I've, I've not heard anything to the contrary. Um, I'm going to take the Chairman's point that um, there may have been more or different um, information that may or may not have helped, but the inference that, that you know, intended or unintended, that there was a desire not to be open and transparent, I've not seen that. Whether better information could have been provided 
in different formats at different times to enable greater levels of scrutiny? I suspect the answer may well be yes, because you can always learn from the past. But certainly going forward, my ambition is that there will be um, transparency. Uh, I want to be held to account. I want the police authority to be in a position to be able to reassure the public that we are doing our job both operationally and organisationally, because, again, that comes back to public confidence. Mr Foley, you've been involved in that, um, so I've left you to last deliberately. Do you feel that, um, in terms of scrutiny of the I-6 project, um, that uh, the SPA has uh, had the information uh, that it requires to scrutinise properly? Yes, uh, I, I would say so. Uh, the programme board certainly is an open and transparent forum, uh, and as the chair said, I sit on on that board. So uh, there's been uh, the flow of information coming through that is the same information which passes to Police Scotland from the contractor. So we see what Police Scotland are seeing. Uh, in addition to that, we also have. Uh, through our committee structures, uh, reporting back at, at various stages. There have been a number of reports made to the full board, uh, but we also have a, an ICT uh, scrutiny uh, forum, which I chair, uh, and I6 has been a, a standing item on that uh, particular forum uh, from the date it was established. Can okay. I just get a date when you became part of that forum, just to know, because this I6 has rumbled on for quite a while, so I, can you just have a date when you became yeah, I, closely involved? Yeah, I, I would have uh, first uh, been part of the forum probably um, towards the, be the very beginning of 2014, I would suggest. I remember there was a contract variation which was put in place around about that time, and I played a, a lead role in the commercial aspects of that contract variation. So it would be around about that time, convener. Okay. Um, uh, just uh, some small points to finish off, convener, if I may. Um, in terms of the openness and transparency of ISEX, those folks who uh, appeared in front of us um, the other week uh, were pretty open and transparent with us as far as they could go, as, as, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, other major projects um, that are currently going on at this moment, what role do the SPA play in terms of being on project boards or on fora um, uh, in these other major projects? And do you have the ability to scrutinise as much as you can on these? Yes. Uh, well, if we take uh, C3, has been mentioned earlier, Mr Stewart, so if we refer to that one uh, specifically, uh, the authority does have representation uh, on the programme board for C3. Uh, we have also established um, a governance and assurance uh, forum uh, specifically uh, for C3, which I chair, uh, and that has uh, member representation uh, from the authority. Uh, one of the members uh, who represents on that uh, particular forum is uh, a, a well-respected uh, ex-senior uh, police officer, so we have policing experience there as well. Uh, police Scotland clearly uh, are on that board, and we have uh, observers from uh, Her Majesty's Inspectorate and Scottish Government. Uh, in addition to that, uh, C3 is subject to uh, regular scrutiny uh, through the full board, and indeed uh, all of the uh, SPA committee structures engage in scrutiny of C3, uh, specifically uh, on subject matters. So, for example, if there were issues that related to staffing associated with the C3 project, then uh, those matters would be taken to the HR committee, and similarly, if there were, in, uh, if there were issues that related to finance, it would go to finance committee and so on. Other projects before we move on? Uh, th those are the two uh, most significant okay. ones. We do have a number uh, of ICT projects which take place within uh, Police Scotland, and they are at various stages uh, of development. Um, they form what was known as the ICT uh, blueprint. And again, uh, these uh, scrutinies carried out on these projects as appropriate by uh, the committees in the same way that I've explained over C3. Um, but again, there is also the ICT forum. Uh, I, I draft. Mm. Mr. Flanagan, Mr. Flanagan, do you think that the SPA are robust enough in their scrutiny of these major projects, yes or no? I think they could be improved, yes. It could be improved. Thank can, you. Can I, thank you. Can I just very quickly, before I get Margaret, and just return to the cost of the I-6 contract. Can you remind me how much money we're talking about here? 
it's, it's roughly about 43 million. So it's 43 million. And mm. I have to say what I've heard is mm. a bit despairing that it doesn't appear there's been the scrutiny during that period of time of 43 million. I'd like to ask what contingency plans are in place of the Chief Constable if the negotiations for that contract fail? Because I understand there's some kind of negotiations just now, but what we got the previous hearing here was um, the persons involved in that behalf of police got not, not happy bunnies with the contractors and didn't seem to have much uh, faith in them. I, I think there's a, a, an understandable um, level of professional and personal disappointment around some of this. Um, at the moment, planning is ongoing in terms of option appraisals, and I think you will have heard last week there was a 12-week period to work through through this. The I6 programme team is looking at all contingency options open to the force and interim solutions using current technologies to support the force over any modular rollout period. So th there is very active consideration of what, what are the available options uh, that we can take a view on at the end of this three-month period. So, um, you know, we are clearly working those up as we speak. I sort, I sort of didn't understand all that. I was trying to get it in more, forgive me, in plain English. Sure. What um, happens if this contract collapses around your ears? Um, what happens to the extra money that Police Scotland has put in to try and sort this out? And it goes, you must have used more staff um, to do it. You're going to get that money back? And what's, what, how have you already got things in place to take over if it doesn't work out? Can't wait for three months. That, that's the work that's ongoing now in terms of developing those options, understanding what the commercial impact is of whatever solution is or is not arrived at and how do we move forward and prioritise um, the, the various elements within the I6 programme uh, in the most sensible order in terms of the risk that some of those areas present to the organisation if we don't move forward. So that, that is the detailed work that's going on now at the moment. And, and I take it that part of these negotiations, and do we know much money are we talking about to date that's been additional costs to Police Scotland through this, which is turning out a wee bit of a fiasco? Um, I don't have those figures do, with me, convenience, so, so I wouldn't want to um, offer a view without having to do, detail. Does Mr Foley have them? Uh, additional uh, costs to date? Well, the, the costs expended to date, uh, convener, uh, including uh, the police staff that worked on it would be bro broadly around about 20 million, short of 20 million, but it's of that magnitude. Oh, thank you. What, what, what we are doing at the moment, as the Chief Constable said, is we are, uh, we are considering the options and uh, we are in a, in a period of uh, commercial review in relation to the contract and uh, I am playing a key role in that. Yeah. Million to date, that's been additional costs in staffing and else things to. Can I clarify that? It's not 20, 20 million is the total expended, including the amount given to the uh, contractor. So it's not the extra cost. So what's the extra costs? At, at this stage, uh, because it's a fixed price contract, there's been no additional costs. Up no, I don't mean under the contract. I mean, what are the additional <coughs> costs? Time at Police Scotland, doing all this extra staff and having to deal with the failures of the contract. What's that running? That must be costing Police Scotland money. Sorry, I, mi I misunderstood the question, convener, that you were asking. I thought you were referring to the total cost expended to date. Uh, as, as I understand it, the, the extra cost uh, of officer time, etc., will be in excess of uh, three million, which is included in that twenty million right, figure that so I gave you. Right. So seventeen plus three. Broadly, yes. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Margaret. We've talked generally about scrutiny. If I could perhaps look at some specifics. Um, Morale and the morale of the force has been a recurring theme when we've, we've taken evidence. Sometimes that manifests itself in absences. Specifically on C3 and Bilson Glen, are the absent figures there um, the same level as they were when there was a tragic incident on the M9? Um, we've obviously looked at this. I'll ask Rose to come in. Um, yeah, we provided the sickness figures to the SPA. There's clearly some issues we needed to get under, so I'll perhaps ask Rose to illuminate that. Um, the, the figures that we have, the current figures that we have at this time of year, uh, obviously we're in a season at the moment of um, where we have the sort of uh, some of our peaks of, of um, absence rates, but the, the, there is a significant reduction in absence at Bilston Glen. Uh, from the previous period that you're describing. 
and overall where we benchmark our sickness rates with um, other uh, uh, forces that provide significant and large contact command and control rates. Our current sickness rates um, compared, for example, with West Midlands Police are um, about half a percent higher and compared with the Metropolitan Service, Police Service are um, very slightly lower at this time of year. Is there still backfilling then going on if we have absence rates? That was a very big issue. Uh, we not in the way that we previously has previously been uh, part of what we were doing when we saw very high absence rates and when we saw vacancies. We've had a very significant um, recruitment campaign for police staff uh, at Bilston and in our service centre in the West as well, and that's been extremely successful. We did a, a very localised uh, set of recruitment um, which has seen a significant number of people come into the service centres. So what we're seeing at the moment in terms of absence rates is in line with um, other organisations seeing a seasonal absence at this time of year. I have to stop you, Margaret. I'm sorry. We can't sit beyond two o'clock. Well, Absolutely. I, it, had mentioned. I think that I really think that we've got one more thing to say. I must apologise to Roderick and Graham. We knew we'd be pushed for time today. Um, I, the only thing I can suggest is that you write your questions to uh, Chief Constable and to the SPA um, and get your answers that way because we will not be sitting again. My apologies to both. Um, and thank you very much for your evidence. I'm sorry we can't sit after two o'clock when the Chamber sits. Um, have to wait. I've got to talk about this. We're going into private. <laughs>